Good day, everyone. It is really such an honor to be here at Inden 2022. I do wish I could be with you in person, uh, but it is a pleasure to be able to interact uh, virtually. And for those of you who are there in person, enjoy the next two days where you can network and share so much important information to uh, advance us in nursing science and education. And those of you who are participating virtually, let's also find ways to digitally share. So thank you so much to the conference organizers for the chance to be here on a theme that I believe is first and foremost a healthcare issue of our day and for which nursing is crucial. And I'm very pleased to see that you all have uh, really got a very thematic uh, approach here um, in, in the conference in terms of thinking about the impact of the climate crisis, climate change, global warming, whatever we shorthand it as, and the, um, the important role of nursing to address it. So uh, I want to just uh, begin by saying um, what, what are we going to try to cover in the next uh, bit of time together. Uh, as I say, the issue of climate the climate crisis and health is something that the conference organizers have done a beautiful job with. I do believe that all the objectives for the conference itself are something that we will be working through as we talk um, over the next uh, uh, bit of time here. That includes the idea of climate justice, addressing equity issues in the impact of climate, the climate crisis on human health in different populations, um, and then therefore addressing the environmental footprint of our work as nurses and in healthcare, both to reduce that environmental impact and to adapt our health systems and our public health systems to be ready to uh, address health for all, including those who are structurally marginalized, is in itself a diversity, equity, and inclusion intervention. And that is one of the goals of the conference. I will also argue, and I hope you will find a takeaway in this, this talk, that advancing in nursing science, as well as practice and education, means that we must address the climate crisis as a nursing focus and priority. And I believe we have ways to do that as we think through both curricular impact and integration of that uh, in, our, in what we teach, in the way that we conduct our own science and scholarship, with whom we work, the partnerships around those, um, those research um, interventions and, and portfolios. Those are all opportunities to live this, um, this priority. And I, again, am very pleased to see that this is a theme throughout the two days of the conference. You have amazing colleagues um, who are going to be part of this meeting, um, including the next session, Dr. Holloway and, and Liz Grant, who will talk about um, uh, global work, Drs. Rosa and Anderson. And there are also, of course, issues on equity and advocacy panels. And so, again, you're going to have a really wonderful meeting. So sometimes I find, and I'm not sure if you do, but sometimes we still have to define, I think, what nursing science is to people who are not nurses. Uh, to me, I, I often feel that Sue Donaldson's definition put here, she was you know, once uh, uh, dean of the school of um, Johns Hopkins School of Nursing, amongst other incredible uh, life career uh, impacts, but I thought this really summarizes it, doesn't it? Nursing is the science of human health ecology. The beauty of nursing science is that we draw from and understand and incorporate basic science, clinical science, translational science, um, community-based participatory research, you know, translational science. I believe we do all of that and pull it together so that we're able to understand the intersection of health across a variety of factors, including environmental factors. So from that sort of you know, micro level of genomic risk, all the way up to macro level of you know, structural risks uh, and all of those effects on the structural determinants of health. Uh, and so I think that um, that kind of framing is one that suits us even as we think about the climate crisis and human health. And our ability to leverage nursing science in that space is important. So again, Sue Donaldson in her early definition with Crowley in the late 70s, she said nursing's um, empiricism principle includes human behavioral interaction with the environment. So again, I think that is um, still relevant today into our, our work. So we're in the Anthropocene. The uh, geologists, the International Society of Stratigraphy, has uh, is finalizing, has finalized that. 
And it means that we as humans, in our economic advancement that has brought, in fact, great advances in human health, but it's had a cost, right? We've left this indelible geologic mark uh, that is now being called the age of, of humans, the Anthropocene. And we know that we even have evidence of that in the geographic strata in terms of looking at carbon impact um, and that big pickup in the mid 20th century that's called the Great Acceleration where we started to use fossil fuels at even higher levels and with subsequent impact on greenhouse gas emissions uh, and the greenhouse effect. So we're in the Anthropocene. How are we addressing it as neuroscientists, faculty, and clinicians? So I will just want to leave you with some main bullets here. And let's just walk through them. If we take nothing else away from this talk but this. The climate crisis is happening. Global warming and other effects that are planetary health related effects. Impact on ecosystems by humans and impact also on other species, not just the human species, it's happening, it's happening now. The impact on human health is already being felt and it's going to be unprecedented as it continues to scale up. But we can do something about it as nurses and as human beings. And I would argue that there's actually an advantage for us as nurses and health professionals that we have some key roles to play, both in mitigation, reducing our, our greenhouse gas emissions and environmental footprint, and adaptation, importantly, which is to say impacts are happening. We must have our health systems ready for those uh, impacts. This is this notion that our colleague uh, who established Healthcare Without Harm, a uh, global NGO, said, healthcare has to be the last building standing. And nurses have to be part of that health system. So we have critical roles to play um, in both reducing our own footprint, because as we know, uh, globally, about 5 to 8% of greenhouse gas emissions are happening directly from the healthcare center sector, uh, but also, again, in adaptation. And this is really the main takeaway that I want you to have. The climate crisis is a health crisis. It's remarkable to me, and maybe you've noticed this as well, that so much of the discussion around um, the environment and global warming and, and, and pollution and all of these um, elements, there'll often be a conversation around reducing things in the energy sector, working on transportation, thinking about agriculture. The health sector is remarkably often left out, but obviously we have a critical role to play. And so just as a shorthand, the climate crisis is a health crisis. That's important framing. And awareness of this fact is really growing. So um, we have colleagues here at Yale who uh, are part of a um, global climate change communication center. And they've been doing surveys both in the US and now globally in multiple countries and are finding that people increasingly are aware that cl the climate crisis is happening. Um, they're aware of it. And they also say, and it's hurting us. It's hurting myself, my family, my, my community, people I know. So that link between knowing and acknowledging that it's happening and seeing the impacts is really, is really growing. And I think we can leverage that awareness. So I'll also mention, because it was sort of in the title of my talk, this concept of planetary health. So when we think about planetary health, simply put, it's thinking about these, uh, these, the, the ecosystems upon which all life depends and human uh, interaction. But really, there were intellectual progenitors to this, the One Health Movement, which you know, are, is sort of the environmental, animal, and human science. That was a precursor. Eco-health was sort of a precursor. Global health elements have, have, have constituted some of these principles. But in 2015, the Rockefeller Foundation did fund a Lancet Commission, and they published this report in Lancet um, that outlined this field called planetary health. And really, it's an emerging area. It aims to understand how we uh, humans uh, are threatening our own health and how to protect ourselves and other species in the biosphere. And there's sort of a growing number of journals. There's a growing number of, of, of publications, um, some growing funding in this space, and including in nursing. So uh, many of our esteemed colleagues who've published some of the leading books on global health have incorporated some of these issues of planetary health. Um, and the framing uh, that fits within uh, that movement. 
and my colleague and I, the wonderful Dr. Teddy Potter, University of Minnesota, who's been a, a real um, a complete leader in this space of planetary health and nursing, recently had an article published where we talked about how, you know, we really must, as nurses and all health professionals, we have to also convey hope as we discuss these issues, because we really truly believe that if we can work together across our disciplines, across sectors, across communities, across politics, across financing, um, we really can actually choose and build and create a healthy future for humans and all life on Earth. And that certainly needs to be our goal. So planetary health, again, um, you know, discussion of is, is, it, is that a subset of global health? Is global health better? We've had a lot of these debates, and I would, I would urge us not to get caught up in the minutia of, of nomenclature. In fact, I'm starting to stop saying planetary health because it, it, it raises questions for people. Well, is that the same as global health? Does that mean we're thinking about the planet and not people? And I just like to say now the climate crisis is a health crisis. Um, but the framing uh, of this subfield, it, it is useful. And uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Laurent Nelson here at Yale School of Nursing, he's our Associate Dean for Global Affairs and Planetary Health. Um, I love this definition that he put out that, you know, we really should be thinking about stewardship of the earth, not prioritizing only the human species. And I think that's a, a very fundamental message. But as you see here in, in the diagram, oftentimes in nursing, frankly, what do we do? We sort of focus on individuals, maybe diets, families, communities to some extent, but often we're very individual focused. That's who's in front of us in the exam room or in the hospital bed. And um, I think public health tends to think more population level. Um, global health is about addressing health inequities wherever they occur around the planet. Um, One Health, as I mentioned, was that area of science that says, let's look at human health, environmental science, and animal health. And so planetary health, I would say, is sort of supra seeding all those and integrating all those concepts. For what it's worth, that's my take on the definition of planetary health. Um, there have been frameworks laid out, WHO and, and by others, to sort of think about not just cl climate, um, the climate crisis of global warming, which is one element here, climate change, but also ozone depletion, deforestation, which is a huge issue, um, changes in land use, uh, arable land uh, and desertification, uh, biodiversity loss, which of course has been enormous. This is this is an extinction. Uh, we're in an extinction era uh, because of human activities. Um, water is going to become a huge. Fresh water is is and is going to become a continuing um, source of strife because it's becoming more scarce. Urbanization can be a plus minus. Uh, Well-designed cities can be healthier, but also um, heat sinks and and can be a source of greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, the um, the reefs uh, are are dying and they're dying at a faster rate than, than we had thought in the past. So all of those are pressures on the ecosystems that undergird uh, life. They will have both direct health impacts, as you all see here, and as many of you may have lived in terms of flooding and heat waves. Um, of course, air pollution continues to be a major killer, uh, preventable killer. Um, there will be ecosystem mediated impacts, health impacts, and then there's sort of indirect and, and referred impacts, and that will include displaced populations both within countries and across regions and across, across uh, countries. So this is going to increasingly be a concern. How do we, develop, how do we deliver health care in the context of displaced populations? And there is an association between um, resource scarcity, um, displacement, um, even heating, and increased interpersonal and intrapersonal strife and um, violence. So again, you know, climate change is one element. I'll just shorthand it as the climate crisis to sort of think about all of these elements and the impact on health. And let's just remember, 88% of people facing these health consequences of environmental threats are living in low and middle income countries, even though it is the high income countries that historically and currently are the biggest contributors to these effects. So this is very much an equity issue. And uh, you'll be hearing from Dr. Rosa and others, um, many of these elements that we think about in this planetary health framework um, will be addressed or are part of thinking about the sustainable development goal framing. So you'll hear more about that uh, uh, later in the session. And again, coming back to the main point, climate crisis is a health crisis. The health sector and the health workforce, including nursing and midwifery, have critical roles to play and that includes reducing our own kind of cleaning house ourselves by reducing our environmental footprint.
and I must say, as a, as a U.S. citizen, we contribute a quarter of the greenhouse gas emissions from the health sector globally. So we have a lot to do in our own space uh, here. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, that got the Nobel Prize, um, many of you may be tracking their reports, which they are, you know, this incredible network of hundreds and hundreds of scientists from around the globe come together, review the data, and put forth um, assessments of the impact of humans uh, on uh, these outcomes. And you can see, and if you look at, if you've looked at those reports over time, there's this increasing certitude and, and statement of fact around the fact that um, humans are the ones who are uh, contributing to these effects. We saw that actually in 2018, it, that it's unequivocal that, unequivocal that, that uh, global heating is related to human activities. Um, this year, 2022, uh, the report was summarized uh, by the head of the UN as uh, showing an atlas of human suffering and damning indictment of failed climate leadership. And so, you know, we really have seen um, both the accumulation of the evidence and understanding of the implications and impact on human health just grow over time. Um, and as we see more and more warming, um, uh, if we go beyond the 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial levels um, by 2040, we're going to see inundated coastlines, we're going to see intensified droughts, we're going to see economic development setbacks and poverty, um, some of those effects that I, I had just outlined previously. Uh, and so, you know, that is, of course, the concern, and that's why the Paris Agreements we're tied to trying to not go above 1.5 degrees Celsius. How are we doing? Not, not as well as we should, and that's a fact. So we continue to see warming uh, and countries committing, but not always falling through on the commitments. Lancet Countdown is a good resource for us as health uh, educators. Um, it is, it, there are data tools that are available on their website. They produce an annual report that can be useful as, as a tracking mechanism. Um, if, we, if we look at last year's report, it was really ma making the point that every region in the world is affected. You all are from all over the world right now. I, you can all outline for yourself um, the impacts that you're seeing amongst your populations and in your nation uh, uh, across a range of, of um, uh, outcomes. You know, we, we have to um, uh, get our greenhouse gas emissions under control because we're not on track to, to do that very well, and it is going to have enormous impact. Um, and we really um, have seen, exemplified by the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, um, the need for that increased international collaboration and, and um, uh, engagement. And I think that's part of what we do well in nursing, including for this, this meeting. So if we look, though, at that, uh, then, um, uh, so th that was the IPCC report from 21. You know, we, we've already seen warming from human activities. It, it is going to exceed at this point, 1.5 degree um, threshold. Uh, we must make rapid reductions. Um, and um, if not, we're going to be headed towards a two or three, possibly even four, but th possibly a three degree centigrade world. Um, and this last year's report was the first to include regional assessments of what climate the climate crisis would do. Uh, and they did talk about, you know, the worst case scenario, potentially up to four degrees. What about this year? So this year's report, thumbnails, climate change is happening. It's happening faster than we thought, the climate crisis. Even if we reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions dramatically right now, there's some locked in effects that will continue to have impact. Those risks are going to escalate that we're already seeing, and some of them will be irreversible. We're going to see more inequity. This is the climate justice piece. Uh, conflict and development declines are likely. But that we need to make efforts in adaptation to address and, and be ready for all of these changes. And those are crucial investments, and um, we have to think about addressing structurally uh, marginalized populations in doing that. So that was the mandate that they put forward. And there was a certain degree of hopefulness in the report also saying we can make some changes um, and there are some solutions outlined in this report. So it is worth taking a look at. Because again, if we go to that three degree plus warming world, 
um, there will be tremendous impact, uh, as, as some are predicting, not only in terms of flooding and displacement, you know, impacts on food production, both micro and macro, um, uh, nutrient declines, uh, and um, coming back to undernutrition as a problem. Heat waves, and we've seen that especially be a, a, a real um, a killer, including of, of older populations. Water, fresh water is an issue. Um, more extreme weather, just generally. And again, the impact on multiple species and the biodiversity loss. So we know that uh, every rise in temperature globally, of course, that's average temperature. The, the increase in, in temperature at the poles is even higher. Um, will have impact on a variety of health conditions and populations. So the, the, the COP26, which is the meeting where all the, the nations get together and try to review and, and make new climate commitments. So last year, and again, this is kind of remarkable, but yes, last year was the first time in 25 years of this meeting where fossil fuel, dirty fuels, were called out as a source of climate crisis. It was also the first time there was ever a health pavilion at a COP meeting, so imagine. How can you leave health out of this equation? WHO really you know, emphasized the link between morbidity and mortality increases and climate change, um, pointed out that actually not enough countries have specific health adaptation or adaptation plans generally, that climate funding is rarely channeled towards the health sector, even though obviously in many countries it's a large part of the health of the overall economy. It's almost 20% of the GDP in the United States. And there are health co-benefits from, from doing the uh, mitigation and adaptation work. So we know, and I think we can feel hopeful also about the young people um, of, of, our, of our time. Many of them, they see what's happening. They know what world they're inheriting. They are speaking out, speaking up. Um, Greta Thunberg, who I took a picture of here um, at Davos a couple years ago, she actually had to get up on a little podium because she's a child and she <laughs> to reach the microphone. But she speaks when she reaches the microphone. Um, and, you know, I think her famous quote then was like, blah, blah, blah. Are you all really making any change that, that's have a, po a policy that's going to have an impact? Um, but there is, there is, you know, more activism out there um, towards changing um, uh, policies that would be important. And the COP26 meeting did tie the theme of science, germane for us in doctoral education, the theme of science connecting to action. Now, COP27 uh, is going to be uh, next year in Egypt, and I hope that many of you will be able to go and that there will be a good nursing presence um, at, at COP27. So I want to just emphasize, point out some pretty dire facts, many of which you're all already familiar with, uh, but to make the point, there are solutions. We do have an evidence base. We do just know some of what can work, and it obviously needs to scale. Thinking about those social determinants, which we do in, in, in nursing, um, thinking about making more climate ready, climate resilient health systems, and we'll talk more about that. Um, thinking about, you know, climate smart healthcare facilities, uh, green energy solutions, um, built environment solutions, all of which can help make more sustainable and healthy communities. So these are the kind of solutions as neuroscientists and educators that I think we need to be um, uh, studying, implementing, um, urging investment in, and then teaching about with our, with our students. And it is important to emphasize those solutions uh, because otherwise, you know, a sense of despair can set in. And there is an increasing recognition of the uh, impact in mental health around what's called solastalgia, which is, you know, mourning the loss of environments, um, PTSD, and even almost pre-TSD. And we're going to need to scale PTSD treatment, including through nurses, because there it will be such impact in so many communities of all these climate crises um, in, uh, effects we have to incorporate an emphasis on mental health, and uh, it's important to do that. So, uh, you know, just thinking about mental health uh, impact, there's going to be both immediate, acute, and chronic um, implications. And I like this chart because I think it actually outlines some of the um, sequelae that we can anticipate or that we can see. And where did I get it? It's from the Weather Channel, which is a uh, you know uh, an organization that really just puts out. Um, weather data that they recognize and they're, they, they're seeing in their own um, uh, uh, constituency the impact of mental health um, from climate change. So talking about climate smart health systems, um, the World Bank 2017 and um, others um, have really uh, put out guidances around this. How do we think, and let's remember, 
nurses often design and are the basis and foundation of, of every healthcare system and often you know, so crucial in public health um, systems as well. How do we think about both the mitigation side of it, where we have lower impact, low carbon, greener healthcare, and also systems that are resilient, that can bounce forward from shocks. And in that intersection, you can sort of say there's, that's a climate smart healthcare approach. Uh, and I think we need to be thinking about all of our healthcare systems with whom we work and that we are engaged in, that we practice in and teach in um, to see what elements are, are in place there or could be advocated for to make the health systems themselves more climate um, smart and resilient. And some elements when we think about the low carbon side of things, at least, and this is definitely an arena that many, um, perhaps many of you have been involved with, uh, you know, thinking about how do we do a better job with anesthetic gas choices or reusability of, of some of our supplies. Uh, you know, um, do we have food that's trucked in from long distances or do we have get it locally? Do we have green space in, in, our, in our hospitals and health systems? There's a variety of, of approaches, and again, that are emerging as best practices um, from which we can learn and, and advocate for. So kind of designing low carbon um, approaches, uh, coordinating the care more effectively so we cut down on that transport uh, cost uh, and environmental impact, utilizing local providers and vendors. Um, thinking about public health uh, priorities in our in our catchment areas, building design uh, and construction is, can be very innovative. Um, investing in renewable sources of energy uh, and energy efficiency in our in our healthcare systems, trying to reduce waste, and we all know how much waste can go into um, healthcare delivery, often particularly in high income country settings, and more sustainable waste management practices, uh, low carbon procurement. So remembering that a lot of what it, it contributes to global health. Uh, to greenhouse gas impact is not just what you do directly, you know, what kind of lighting or energy source I have in my hospital, but all of those supply chain pieces of, of the, the materials you use, where do they come from, what was the transport cost, that's where a lot of the impact actually is, um, but thinking about what the elements that we can control in our, our own health system. And then resilient strategies um, to withstand and, and recover from extreme events. And those resilience strategies include the human factor as well. How do we take care of our workforces? How do we prepare them? If you're in an area that's experiencing extreme weather, the health workforce who's going to go staff the hospital to accept the patients who've been uh, affected by that extreme weather will also be affected. How do we do some of that uh, anticipatory planning and support for our health workforces themselves? A um, very crucial element. Again, the design, uh, very creative design elements coming through about how we can do a better job. And there are some wonderful examples from um, many low-income country settings, you know, using natural ventilation, green roofs, um, water catchment. There's really some um, wonderful bi-directional learning that we can all get from each other to think about um, low energy impact um, and um, uh, greenhouse gas emitting impact of our health, health system buildings themselves. Um, good opportunity there. And this really is all about resilience, again, for the health system, for the workers in the health system, which are primarily nurses in those countries, right? Um, so what are some of those principles of building health system uh, uh, resilience? You know, we, we have to be able to adapt, because even if we cut greenhouse gas emissions already, as our IPCC report 2022 pointed out, uh, we are going to have some baked in effects of global heating. And so, you know, we've there will be some inevitable impacts for which our health systems should prepare. It's going to happen everywhere. It will happen in different ways, different configurations of, of, uh, of risk. Um, and so understanding and working with local decision makers and, and data um, systems to understand what kind of events are most likely to happen, um, uh, what will affect our population, what are, who, where are our most at risk. Um, populations, how do we access them and support them, uh, you know, before a crisis, during a crisis, after a crisis, emergency preparedness and planning, and certainly COVID has brought that back home, um, and then monitoring uh, as well and metrics. We work with um, clients, uh, patients, um, families, populations at risk. We have that trusted moment and opportunity to convey some anticipatory guidance, to incorporate, you know, a sense of a child with asthma, you know, if, if the air quality is going to be worse, you know, how do you anticipate that and um, try to prevent uh, an episode or a spiking of visits to the ED for asthma events? 
um, thinking about how to get facilities prepared, uh, even in terms of thinking about demand surges, um, in terms of census, as well as, as just electrical utilization, microgrids, and, and trying to um, make sure that hospitals have backup systems uh, for energy if that goes down um, in a broader way with utilities, thinking about the transport and the workforce support pieces. And again, a big picture focus on the population health piece. And I would say this calls us back to our origins in nursing. You know, Florence Nightingale and others, there was always an understanding of the human person in the context of their environment, and, and broad, broadly speaking. So that, that is certainly, I think, a, a, a fundamental part of our approach as, as a discipline uh, of nursing. I also think that prevention is something that's elemental to nursing. But sometimes we cede it too much to public health, I would argue. Oftentimes, so much of our nursing science is focused on maybe secondary prevention, tertiary prevention. How do we help the person with disease X cope with their you know, symptom constellation cluster Y? And those are certainly nursing interventions and wonderful work and necessary work. But what about preventing disease X in the first place? If we truly prioritize and put our budgets <laughs> which is, of course, our moral documents. Where do we emphasize um, what we care about in healthcare? Well, it's not prevention because it's two to three percent of most uh, health budgets. And yet, think about how much more sense that makes, both for the health of people to prevent these downstream impacts. And also, if we deliver less, have to deliver less clinical care, we will reduce our, our footprint, period. Prevention is itself a climate change intervention because if we can really realistically reduce the total delivery, particularly of quaternary care, you know, we will reduce the, the impact of, of, of providing health care, period. So, you know, for, for all of us to think about in our own space and in our own setting, you know, what are likely to be some of these planetary health effects that will affect human health you know, of our populations? It might be heat waves, you know, it might be um, poor air quality that spikes. It might be flooding, not just coastally, but even you know, with rivers um, and internal uh, interiors. Uh, it might be, of course, shifts in, in vectors um, and, and disease um, distribution. So how do we then think about what we need to do as nurses? Um, and obviously, knowing the resources and networks in our area, think about how we really connect beyond our own space with all of our colleagues who might be able to address uh, that particular health issue. Um, including not just in healthcare delivery, but public health systems. Um, and thinking about, again, uh, how do we also become anticipatory, use data to hopefully uh, be able to have more forewarning of some of the events and impacts, think about population displacement, um, think about a focus not just on outpatient care um, and inpatient impact, but also community care as disease burdens might shift. Think about water, uh, waterborne illness, uh, food-related um, issues, um, and then again, of course, mental health as a uh, very uh, large uh, source of morbidity um, related to climate, the climate crisis. Again, working with surveillance systems, data systems, our health departments, as well as our health uh, our care systems uh, to do more planning and to be anticipatory. And again, as we've seen with the impact of COVID, how do we utilize tools like telehealth um, in order to be able to deliver care and keep some continuity of care when there are systems disruptions, which there will be more of. So some of you may be working in fabulous health systems that are doing amazing things at a local level or even a national level. And I'd love to, for us to be able to share more of those examples, but certainly the National um, Health Service um, in, the, in England, in the UK, the NHS in the UK, has really put a stake in the ground around this, and they're one of the very first to really say at a national total health system level, we're going to become carbon net zero um, as, as a national healthcare delivery system. So greenhouse gas emissions offset by, by uh, with, with using offsets perhaps, eventually we hope to all be actually uh, uh, carbon zero, not, not emitting any greenhouse gas emissions, but certainly they've made this very big commitment to the idea of a carbon net zero national health system. Uh, and so, you know, that, that just started a couple of years ago. Those of you who are here from the UK, you might be able to comment on, on how that's going. Um, but it's been interesting to see the tools and the 
dissemination that um, people from the NHS are doing in terms of trying to understand our carbon footprint, where are all the elements coming from, which activities, where might we have the most impact, um, if we think systemically uh, about, about um, the, the, the system, including that supply chain, um, where, where are the big elements of the footprint, how can we, if we worked here, how would that reduce um, uh, issues? And so you can see where some of these, you know, um, bottles of care delivery, more prevention versus anesthetic choices, uh, travel and transport, keeping that more local, um, and uh, you know, then there's the supply chain and purchasing. So it, it's a nice example of seeing where an entire health system is trying to uh, address both um, mitigation, and you can see some examples here uh, of trying to reduce uh, some of the environmental footprint, but also adaptation. So um, I have the honor of working with Dr. Lakone uh, Atwali, who is a psychiatrist from Kenya. Um, we work on the uh, Board of Global Health with the National Academy of Medicine here in the US. He was the lead author on this fantastic article, which many of you may have read. It was published simultaneously in over 200 clinical journals around the world. And it was this call for action, um, you know, just last year, basically saying we, it's an emergency, right? It's happening. Healthcare and health workers have to be um, committed to, to changing this to protect human health and other species' health. Um, and, and so this is sort of this really clarion call. Uh, and so I, I just urge those of you who haven't read that article, I think it summarizes quite a bit of it. And again, as COP27 gathers in Egypt, we hope that there's an opportunity to have more nursing presence and not just a, a health emphasis, which again, really just started last year. So. I hope that you have the opportunity in these next two days of the conference, and maybe even after this talk, to share some examples of what you're doing at your schools and nursing in your doctoral programs. Um, what's working? What isn't? What have you found to be good tools to use as faculty? Uh, how are we teaching some of these concepts and interventions? How are we researching it? Who are we partnering with to do that research? Um, and again, how are we disseminating? So great opportunity because um, this is urgently, this is urgent work for us, not just in doctoral uh, education and nursing, but, but for, for the health of the, of the whole planet. Um, and we know, that, again, that, that climate, the climate crisis and all its attendant effects is happening everywhere, but it doesn't affect every population equally. So we know that equity is a concern, as I've raised. Different structurally marginalized populations are going to be hit first and hardest, and the existing health disparities will be exacerbated um, by these uh, crisis uh, impacts. And we saw that certainly with COVID-19 as kind of a uh, amplifier. Uh, populations are at higher risk. So we have to think about the structurally marginalized populations, whether it's biologic risk or social, socially constructed risk. That might include yet very young, um, older, those with NCDs, those who are, again, um, structurally marginalized. And certainly the heat and, and older population impact is something that we we are well aware of um, and that has been um, well documented uh, everywhere. So addressing climate crisis and health and the equity issues around that, how are we doing that? Um, in the United States, I'm, I am happy to say that we, we did just get an office, um, the Department of Health and Human Services, which is one of the largest funders of healthcare um, in the United States, as well as research, uh, did create a new office on climate change and health equity. And Dr. Rachel Levine, who's the Assistant Secretary of HHS, who was actually our commencement speaker um, here at the Yale School of Nursing, she was wonderful, uh, you know, is, is, has really spearheaded that along with um, our colleague John Balbus. So that is an office you can get on their mailing list um, that really is trying to incorporate the latest science on addressing the climate crisis, health, and equity. Because we're talking about doctoral education, I did find this, uh, this small study from a PhD student very interesting. So if we think about, you know, we're all embedded in the modern world, we're all contributing to this space. Some of you flew to Scotland, I would have if I could have, you know. We are all part of this impact on the planet and our own health, and how do we try to minimize that is important to do both at the very macro level of national policies and international um, collaboration, but even think about our individual impact. And so this PhD student, uh, modeled the mortality cost of carbon. You can argue with the model, it was a, it was a dissertation. But um, 
bottom line was basically this idea that um, if your family size is about three and a half people, which uh, in, and you're living in a high income country setting, your lifetime emissions from that household family size will directly contribute to one excess death um, in low income country settings. It may not be a completely accurate model, um, but it does frame things, doesn't it? So these equity and health pathways, which we've been concerned about in nursing science for a very long time, um, you know, th there are opportunities to think about how we work from what we've known uh, about addressing uh, health inequities to, to address the climate crisis um, uh, exacerbated inequities. And I think this is really a theme of nursing research or a framing that we often use. And I think as nurse scientists and educators, we need to be thinking about disrupting those pathways, understanding them and disrupting them. And here in the United States, the National Institute of Nursing Research, which we're very um, uh, proud to be able to have, Dr. Shannon Zenk is the director of NINR, they put out a recent strategic plan and they really put equity uh, front and center in the uh, NINR plan. So this idea that nursing science itself is going to focus on dismantling structures that perpetuate structural racism, uh, other um, uh, impacts on marginalized populations, and get in the way of health equity. Um, other goals of the, of, the, of the plan talk about using a multi-level perspective of nursing science. So not just that patient to clinician or patient to patient kind of level, but this whole macro to micro kind of framing, um, multi-level socio-ecological kind of framing, if you will, to address all those determinants of health that are, are relevant across the lifespan, um, and then using science for healthcare across the lifespan as well. And I would argue that we have an incredible resources uh, as nurses. We ourselves are <laughs> a disruptive intervention. Um, and we have some attributes that are useful in this incredible crisis of our time. We tend to be pragmatist, right? We tend to jump in, try to get it done. We, we, we don't get dissuaded. Um, we can become um, exhausted uh, and discouraged, of course, but as a whole and as a professional framing, we do try to move forward um, to put in place things that will improve people's health. We understand the impact of inequity and we feel that that's something we have to address. Um, we work with people, right, uh, by, by definition, basically. Um, we often work with communities and that's a, taking a strength-based approach it can be a, a really important tool. Uh, we do science and we pr promote not just new knowledge generation, but translation of science into practice. We want to see it get into practice and scale up, right? Um, so all of those attributes are great to address the climate crisis. And we need to talk about the climate crisis and health, right? The climate crisis is a health crisis. And our colleague, again, here at the Climate Change Communication Center um, have pointed out that there's some better and, and, and less effective, more effective and less effective ways um, from, that we know from psychological sciences uh, to be able to uh, uh, talk about this, that, you know, telling stories can be very powerful. Numbers numb, right? Personal stories are a universal kind of link that people can relate to. Um, trying to find and activate group norms. We're certainly seeing Greta Thunberg and all her youth um, activists and movements like the Extinction Movement, you know, putting together group norms to try to take collective action. Um, there's this idea that we have to think about the saliency. This is happening now. It might be affecting your family or will be. How do we anticipate uh, making it local and, and real? Um, gain framing. Right, which we know from behavioral science is an important way to get people to do some behavior change. Not about what you're losing, but what you can gain. And certainly all of these mitigation uh, interventions have health co-benefits, right? So we both reduce our imprint and have better health. Um, and then, you know, finding sort of people's intrinsic motivations, whatever they may be. Maybe religious, it may be family related, it may be any, any number of things. And the guiding principle here, and we should bear this in mind as we talk about this work as nurse, nurse scientists and educators, simple messages repeated often from trusted sources. And nurses are trusted. So um, here, certainly in the United States, uh, Gallup poll has been carried out for um, uh, almost two decades now, and nursing, except for one year, which is the 9-11 year, always comes out as the most trusted profession. That's a strength and a power we can use that power for good, for advocacy. 
because we are a trusted profession. So as we think about working with our students and working as faculty and, and clinicians and researchers, um, you know, we can be the, 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 the role model that we wish um, uh, our students to become. Um, we should also put it in a humanistic context, you know, um, express that optimism that helps people move beyond despair. Uh, and, and again, think about taking the evidence base that we have and put it into, into practice. There's a social side, a political scientist at Harvard. Um, they, they did a study some years ago looking at civil resistance campaigns in the 20th century and um, found that uh, campaigns of nonviolent civil resistance were twice as successful as, um, as violent uh, resistance, which is one interesting point. But they actually found this kind of interesting quantitative rule of thumb, which is that in all those episodes of civil resistance um, studied, that once the citizenry got involved in that campaign at the level of three and a half percent of the population or more, no government could withstand it. So that activating even just a relatively small percentage of a population towards a common goal can have real impact. I just find that hopeful. Um, and this is just the data from, from their study um, looking at, at these, um, these campaigns because if applied to my own country, the U.S., where we have about 4 million nurses, we only have to get 140,000 nurses really on board with advocating for these changes. I think we can do that. And in fact, some of our colleagues are really working in this space. So um, the uh, Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environment and Healthcare Without Harm uh, and others are putting together this uh, Nurses Climate Challenge. There's one in the U.S., there's also one in Europe now. Hopefully that will be extended to other regions as well. And already, you can see here on the, uh, in the U.S. side, they have you know, come close to the goal of 50,000. Well, let's just triple that goal, and we already have that 3.5% of a population that can make a difference um, in, in, the, in the nurse professional space. And of course, nursing as a, as a profession and a discipline has taken a stance on this uh, over a period of, of years, really, um, position statements and uh, an appreciation of not just climate, the climate crisis specifically, but environmental impact. And so we have that to draw from, and ICN, of course, has made these statements as well. So in every nation around the world, nursing has taken a policy stance on this. At my own school, uh, Yale School of Nursing, um, which was the first academically based school of nursing um, in, in the U.S., um, first one to say nursing should be taught in, as an independent discipline uh, in, in a uh, higher education setting, not just uh, in hospitals. And, um, and so we, we have been trying to think about how do we contribute to addressing the climate crisis and health and human health crisis. And we're trying to approach it not just in our curriculum, which we'll talk about a little bit more. We, are de we have developed a continuing education module for nurses on planetary health nursing. That will be available soon through Yale Coursera. Uh, we also do research in this space, related space. Um, two of our doctor of nursing practice uh, graduates did a fabulous first ever nurses candidate school, nurses and midwives candidate school, to teach nurses how to become, how to run for office and make that policy change directly. And then we work with our hospital system to think about more sustainable healthcare delivery. Um, we've also tied these issues to our scientific priorities at our university. So we're calling this the Planetary Solutions Project. It addresses not just biodiversity issues and carbon sequestration and other approaches, but human health impact as well. Um, and uh, we, our three health science schools are very engaged in that work. So we have an opportunity. We have a clearing call to action. We are trusted. We know the evidence base. We know how to convey that to work with people, um, both for their own health impact and for community health. Um, we can focus on prevention. We can take action in our own settings, join a green team on our hospital unit, work with our public health system, um, work to make our systems both more sustainable, climate resilient, um, and ready. Engage in advocacy and, and policy making. That is a part of nursing. Um, and then, of course, growing the science and the implementation of the science that works. As we think about doctoral education specifically, because of course um, that is, that is the uh, wonderful focus of this gathering, 
um, there's much that we can do in integrating this, these concepts, the science and the interventions and the framework into our curriculum, I would argue. Um, McDermott Levy and others have pointed out that we can integrate this into nursing curriculum across all the usual spaces, you know, that we, uh, populations or conditions that we focus on, but, but also um, nurse leadership and transitional science approaches. Um, again, focusing on prevention is important, uh, both for the health of people as well as reducing the impact of healthcare delivery overall. Um, interdisciplinary approaches are always uh, useful. Systems thinking is something we do well in nursing, but we can learn from our engineering colleagues about how to do that even better. We can talk to our architecture colleagues about how to design that better green health um, healthcare delivery building, um, and, and all of that is important. And also, I think, as we think about translational and implementation science, we do that very well in nursing. I think that's a sweet spot for us. Um, and again, partnering with communities to do this work. As I mentioned, McDermott Levy and, and colleagues um, pointed out the elements that can be incorporated into our curriculum in order to um, uh, have more of this, uh, th this work taught to each generation of our next generation of faculty and researchers and um, leaders, including evidence-based practice and research and, and nurse leadership elements. Um, in the United States, uh, our, our competencies, our, our, our creditors who put out competencies for nursing have now included that nursing students should learn about planetary health principles. So we have an opportunity to create that curriculum and share it with each other so we don't all have to recreate the wheel, hopefully. Um, there's a group called Nurse, Nurses Sustainability that also has examples of, of uh, incorporating this, this kind of material. There is a global consortium on climate and health education, and they've got examples of curriculum and curriculum planning tools and um, uh, some core competencies that have been outlined and updated uh, in 2020. Um, we can use all the tools. Uh, the picture here is um, here at my school. We have a fantastic simulation faculty. They're amazing. And uh, every year we do a disaster simulation. And we, we involve the fire department people, the, the, the police, um, and it make it as realistic as possible. And these are the kind of events that we simulate that m one might encounter from um, planetary health stresses. And so trying to get our students ready in all, in all the ways, including some use of simulation. In our PhD program at Yale School of Nursing, our faculty did a wonderful job of uh, taking a very careful review of the curriculum and um, putting it all in a framing, the Bronf Brenner framing, of a socio-ecological model. So that we think about tying now, there's threads of tying our, our, our PhD education all the way through, where you can imagine in the boxes to the, to the right there, what factors you might lay out at that you know, individual level or at that um, interpersonal level or at the institutional level, at the community level, and then society and um, environment and ecological level. So we're using this framing and have pulled that thread through our own uh, PhD education. We also, of course, in the U.S. and, and other countries, uh, though not all, have the practice doctorate in nursing, the doctor of nursing practice. Um, we have that both in a leadership framing and a clinical framing and they need to do projects uh, towards the end of their um, education in the DNP space. And we're seeing some interesting projects coming forward with at least our own students working with health systems and populations at risk, thinking specifically about a climate crisis and health framing. So that, that will be uh, uh, you know, in increase, increasing evidence and interventions that people can put into play in nursing. I'm just gonna wrap up here there's incredible wisdom and expertise and experience amongst the attendees of the conference. I hope you get a chance to share with each other. I think we need to do more of that more, more readily and more rapidly. Um, and as you um, go into the next uh, session and the, the next two days, I think we should think um, broadly about how are we approaching our doctoral education? Is it incorporating this broad perspective, whether you call it a planetary health framework or not, um, that addresses the climate crisis and the impact on human health. Um, is some of our focus on individuals or sort of a, you know, um, con disease condition X kind of framing, um, is that sometimes perhaps too restrictive as we have to think more broadly about these population level impacts? And um, how do you see the climate crises affecting your own research? your own scholarship? How's it affecting populations that you care about and have worked with? Um, 
are, are the people who are funding the scholarship thinking about this, this direction as being important to fund? Um, are we seeing more publications in this space? Uh, and I think we also then need to think about it for our own students as they think about the PhD, the PhD and, and DNP students thinking about their careers, how will they incorporate this new reality uh, of the Anthropocene into the work they do? Um, and again, I hope that we can share best practices and uh, particularly in the space, not just of mitigation because that's a little more straightforward in some ways, but adaptation which incorporates you know, emergency preparedness and um, data use and systems thinking and making those climate resilient health systems. We certainly need to do more of that. We can do more of it. We are the ones who run health systems. We are, as the WHO pointed out in its first State of the World's Nursing 2020 report, we are 59% of every health workforce, nurses and midwives in every, every nation around the world. So we are engaged. We can be even more engaged um, and that will help create a better world. I thank you for your part in that and good luck with the rest of the conference.